The water balance organs of animals come in a variety of shapes and forms, but nearly all are built upon the same logical architecture. The insects are the notable exception to this, but as we've said before, insects are notable exceptions for nearly all aspects of their biology, and we'll consider water balance for them a bit later. For most other animals, the water balance organs are composite structures made up of many similar functional subunits called nephrons. We'll use the fish nephron as an exemplar of all these diverse water balance organs, in part because it's simple in architecture and it's relatively simple in function. And it's fairly representative of similar structures in other kinds of animals. The fish nephron is found among many similar nephrons that together make up the kidney. Like every other vertebrate, the fish has two kidneys, a right and a left. We can find the fish's kidney just below the vertebral column as two long cylindrical organs just on either side. If we look at the kidney more closely, we see that the kidney is actually a composite structure made up of many of these nephron subunits. The nephrons are basically tubular structures, and the kidney contains several thousand of them arrayed along the kidney's length. Each nephron tubule opens up into a common tube known as the ureter. The ureter itself drains into a chamber, the cloaca, which it shares in common with the large intestine. The word cloaca is Latin for sewer, and it's an apt description because the cloaca is the common receiving point for both urine from the kidneys and feces from the digestive tract. The cloaca, in turn, opens up to the outside of the body through an opening known as the vent. There's one important feature of the nephron that's important to understand before we get into its more detailed structure and function. Namely, that the inside of the tubular nephron is a space that's actually contiguous with the outside environment. The array of nephrons in a kidney, therefore, is a very highly folded interface between the environment and the body fluids. Let's now look at the structure of the nephron in some more detail. The interface of the vertebrate nephron folds two bodies of liquid into close proximity. There is an interface between the outside environment and body fluids known as the tubular nephron. On the other side of this interface is the bloodstream, which makes up the other half of the nephron known as the vascular nephron. The tubular nephron collects fluids from the body water. The initial collection point for this is a cup-shaped structure known as the Bowman's capsule. Liquid that gathers in the Bowman's capsule drains into the so-called proximal convoluted tubule, and then into a comparatively narrow tubule known as the isthmus. The isthmus then drains into another convoluted tubule, the distal convoluted tubule, and then ultimately into the collecting duct, which leads ultimately to the ureter and then to outside the body. The vascular nephron starts with an afferent renal arteriole, which is derived ultimately from the renal artery. This feeds into a complicated capillary plexus called the glomerulus that sits nestled within the cup of the Bowman's capsule. From the glomerulus, blood drains into the efferent renal arteriole and then into another capillary plexus that wraps around the convoluted tubules and collecting ducts known as the vasorecta. Blood from the vasorecta then drains into the renal vein. The function of the nephron can appear to be quite complex, but it has a certain simple logic to it that can help unravel this complexity, what we might call the nephron's logic. Nephron function starts with a process called filtration, in which the liquid part of the blood, that is the blood plasma, is filtered across the junction between the glomerular capillaries and Bowman's capsule, exuding a liquid known as filtrate into the capsule. The filtrate consists of water, the soluble salts, small solutes like sugars and amino acids, as well as certain other soluble wastes. It does not include the blood cells or the proteins of the blood plasma, which stay in the blood that flows through the glomerulus. 
We'll have much more to say about filtration in a little bit, but for now, suffice it to say that filtration produces a voluminous amount of filtrate, along with whatever burden of filterable solutes that is contained within the blood plasma. Filtrate, as it's produced, will force a flow of liquid into the proximal convoluted tubule, where the next process, reabsorption, takes place. Reabsorption also occurs in the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts. As with filtration, we'll have much more to say about the process of reabsorption momentarily. Suffice it to say for now that reabsorption allows the recovery mostly of water, but also of salts, as well as what we might call small useful solutes like sugars and amino acids. Note that the soluble wastes are not reabsorbed. Again, we come back to the logic of the nephron, so to speak. The process of filtration involves the removal of voluminous amounts of material from the blood and transla translocating it into a space, the interior of the tubular nephron, that is topologically contiguous with the outside environment. Reabsorption recovers useful materials back into the body water before the filtrate is excreted from the body as urine. As the filtrate modified by reabsorption flows through the convoluted tubules, it's modified in another way. This is the process of secretion, which is, in many ways, the opposite of reabsorption. In reabsorption, there's a translocation of materials to the body fluids from the space contained within the convoluted tubules and collecting ducts. In secretion, material is translocated the other way, from the body fluids into the tubule. The end product of this serial process of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion is urine. Thus, we come back to the basic logic of the nephron. It's a means of translocating filtrate from the body to a controlled environment that is topologically outside the body and then modifying its composition in ways that produces a very different liquid, urine, that is ultimately excreted from the body. In short, the nephron produces filtrate and converts it into urine. When we come to speak about the evolution and adaptation of kidney function, it will be helpful to understand something of the evolutionary history of the nephron. First though, let's review some of the basics about vertebrate embryology. Vertebrates, like most animals, are triple blasts. That is, they have three germinal layers that form early on in embryonic development. The ectoderm forms the outer coating of the skin, and after some developmental contortions, the nervous system of vertebrates. Early on, the embryo also folds in on itself and forms a complete tube through it, making up the digestive tract, which is lined with the second germinal layer, the endoderm. Through embryonic development, an intermediate germinal layer, the mesoderm, forms to fill in the space between endoderm and ectoderm. Also fairly early in development, a space opens up in the interior of the mesoderm to form the coelom, which is a word from the Greek for hollow or cavity. The coelom eventually becomes lined with an epithelial layer that becomes the peritoneum. The primitive nephron did not combine filtration with reabsorption and secretion, as the fish nephron does, but it separated these functions. Let's look more closely at the peritoneum and associated structures lining the coelom. Here, the peritoneum is vascularized by a number of capillary knots called capillary plexi. The capillary plexus, the singular, is the evolutionary forerunner of the glomerulus. The plexus is fed with blood at high pressure from the renal artery. At the same time, the peritoneal lining comes to be perforated by numerous openings called coelomastomes. These form the primitive tubular structures that lead ultimately to the outside of the body via the cloaca. The tubular drain from the coelomastome was invested with a network of blood vessels that constituted the primitive vasorecta. 
This was originally fed by the low pressure circulation of a different part of the circulatory system, the renal portal system, which is derived from the veins draining the posterior parts of the body. The original function of the capillary plexus was to produce coelomic fluid by filtration across the peritoneal wall. As coelomic fluid, filtrate really, accumulated in the coelom space, it was drained via the coelomastome. As this fluid passed through the tubular structures and out to the cloaca, reabsorption and secretion took place there. Thus, the three functions, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, which are combined into one structure in the fish nephron, were originally separate functions fed by two distinct parts of the circulation. The story of the evolution of the nephron is basically the gradual fusion of these separate structures for filtration, reabsorption, and secretion into the single functional unit of the nephron. Let's draw up the primitive condition that we've just outlined in some detail with a capillary plexus that filters liquid from the blood into the coelom, fed by the high pressure circulation of the renal artery, and a coelomastome that drains coelomic fluid from the coelom and modifies it by reabsorption and secretion through the vasorecta as it flows through. The vasorecta is still fed by the low pressure circulation of the renal portal system. The first major evolutionary change was the origin of the Bowman's capsule. This is a condition still seen in some fish and modern amphibians. There is still an open coelomastome, but now an additional outpocketing of the from the tubule that drains the coelomastome has emerged to envelop the capillary plexus, which has now sunk inward away from the peritoneal wall. The capillary plexus is still enveloped by a peritoneum of sorts, though, but now the epithelium enveloping it is the small isolated epithelium of the Bowman's capsule. Now, filtrate is formed directly into the Bowman's capsule, but there is still the option for a drainage of coelomic fluid through the open coelomastome. Reabsorption and secretion still occur as liquid from the filtrate and coelomic fluid pass through the tubule, the high-pressure glomerular circulation is still separate from the low-pressure circulation of the vasa recta. The modern nephron, which is characteristic of reptiles, birds, and mammals, came about through the closure of the coelomastome, so that now all liquid feeding into the tubular nephron is derived from filtrate from the glomerulus. Now, reabsorption and secretion work on filtrate only, with no involvement from the coelomic fluid and this completes the tubular nephron of modern vertebrates. The second major evolutionary change completed the vascular nephron by merging the circulation from the efferent renal arteriole into the vasorecta, which is now fed by both the low-pressure renal portal system and the efferent renal arteriole. There are many and diverse nephron-like structures found throughout the animal kingdom that do much the same things that the nephrons of vertebrates do. For now, though, we have to understand better how the processes of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion work to produce filtrate and to convert that filtrate into urine. We'll concentrate on the function of the vertebrate nephron to show how this is done.